to discuss the growing relationship between China and the United Kingdom. We welcome from London, Martin Jacques. He is a senior fellow at the Department of Politics and International Studies at Cambridge University and author of When China Rules the World. From Beijing, Peter Ho is an economist and a research fellow at the London School of Economics. Philip Lacour is a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. He joins us from Boston. And here in our studio, CGTN correspondent Nathan King. Welcome to all of you. Peter, let me start with you. Trade between China and the United Kingdom increased by 64% since 2010. So business certainly is booming. What do you see as the major goals for this ninth strategic dialogue? Well, uh, one very, very important uh, issue is, of course, uh, what will happen uh, with trade after the Brexit. And uh, China and the UK are uh, very important trading partners to each other. Uh, China is actually already uh, uh, investing a lot in the UK, for example, in Manchester or in uh, Heathrow Airport, in Brit British Telecom, so on and so forth. And uh, the UK is already the second largest trading partner uh, with China in the, UA in, in the U uh, European Union. Uh, at the same time, however, uh, the Brexit will have a very uncertain effects on the relation between China and the UK. And it's very uncertain whether the UK, for example, can continue its uh, platform for the internationalization of the renminbi, which at the moment is already the second largest platform in the world for the renminbi. But it's uncertain whether that will continue after the Brexit. So we can see that uh, this will be a major issue that will be discussed uh, over the long term between China and the UK. And of course, there are so many, many uncertainties around this. Uh, so it's not very clear where things will be going. Martin Jacques, Peter Ho raises the point there about Britain's relationship, trade relationship with China, indeed Britain's trade relationship with the rest of the world post-Brexit. Uh, let's listen to the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, talking last January about this. Let's watch. I'm pleased that we've agreed to intensify the golden era of UK-China relations. The UK and China are both global powers with a global outlook. And you made reference, Premier Lee, to the uh, United Kingdom leaving the European Union as we do so and become ever more outward looking. And as China continues to reform and open up, we're committed to deepening our strong and vital partnership. So, Martin, how do you see this relationship evolve in terms of trade, economic relationship post Brexit? Well, I think, first of all, Peter's quite right. I think still, even though we're now, you know, at the 11th hour, we just don't know what is going to happen with regard to Brexit. I mean, th there are still, the, more or less, the whole menu of options is still uh, on the table. So it's very difficult to uh, speak with any kind of certainty about the situation. Um, I mean, I think that... Uh, uh, let's assume for the moment that uh, Brit Britain does uh, exit uh, the European Union um, and uh, uh, there is maybe some kind of compromise on customs union and so on. I don't know w exactly what that might look like. Now, in that situation, it seems to me Britain will certainly be uh, looking for, uh, anxiously looking for agreements. And, uh, and China is... And the an absolutely obvious candidate. But you also have to say that uh, since the departure of the Cameron Osborne government and the, you know, the declaration, if you like, of the golden age in the relationship, the leadership of the government under May has been much more cautious. I mean, it's not, it's not retracted, but it's been much more cautious in its attitude uh, towards China. But uh, when push comes to shove, um, it may well be, actually, uh, that Britain has to be much bolder uh, in its relationship with China. Certainly, that, uh, that possibility cannot be excluded. Philip Lacour, let's look at some figures here. China is the UK's fifth largest trading partner. That's after the United States and several European countries. Trade between these two countries amounted to just under $78 billion in 2016. 
and Britain also runs a trade deficit with China. Where do you see this going? Well, I think the word uncertainty, obviously, uh, is key in, the, in this debate. I mean, uh, remember that the, the person who invented the, the, the qualification of golden era was David Cameron, who was the very one who organized a referendum that was lost mm. and, and that is now leading to this very uh, uncertain time uh, in terms of the UK probably having to leave the EU in, in, in very obscure, uh, uh, under very obscure conditions. On the other hand, you have China, which is uh, uh, also facing a trade war with the United States and, and was also desperate for, for, for partners. So the two countries are kind of looking at uh, reinforcing the golden era concept. But at the moment, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing much uh, uh, bright about it, except that everybody is trying to, to you know, uh, uh, play a role. Um, I would say that, you know, the, the main problem that the UK has to face is the, is the relationship with the EU, which is the biggest trading partner of the UK. And China has to deal with, with the US, which is the, also its largest um, partner, uh, trade partner. Meanwhile, the EU, of course, is there. And as you know, last week, President Juncker was in Washington. And there was this deal between President Trump and, and himself about, uh, you know, lifting trade sanctions between the, uh, the U.S. And, 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 and the EU. So that's probably a blow to the U.K. and, and to China in some ways. Nathan, uh, there was a news conference. Foreign Minister Wang Yi, as well as Jeremy Hunt, the British Foreign Secretary, held a news conference. This is uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi at that news conference. Holding dialogue and not resorting to confrontation to deal with trade frictions is China's consistent stance. It's also the only correct channel to solving problems. China's door is always open for dialogue, but dialogue must be held on the basis of equality, mutual respect, and established rules. Any sort of unilateral threats or pressure will result in backfire. Now, of course, this strategic dialogue is not just about trade relations. Right. It's about international issues, uh, regional issues uh, that are of concern to both countries. What's on the agenda here? Well, I mean, you know, I think every one of our guests is right into saying Brexit is the cloud that hangs over everything because you don't know what the UK is going to become in two years. So that's hanging over everything. But there is also a worry from Beijing that the UK may be siding with the US and then other uh, US allies when it comes to issues potentially in the South China Sea. There's, for example, a debate about sending the new aircraft carrier to work with uh, Australian uh, forces um, soon, which doesn't carry out freedom of navigation operations uh, in the South China Sea. But the, US, the UK sending an aircraft carrier to the South China Sea, that's not great. So this is sort of strategic dance, if you like. Um, also, the UK, of course, speaks up about Hong Kong more often than anyone else, considering their post-colonial relationship. But I think, really, this talk of a golden era, let's face it, happened in another era. <laughs> and that was before the referendum, before Brexit. And Brexit is hanging over everything. And something that I've noticed, really interestingly, is that the US, under the Trump administration, would like the UK to be much more separate from Europe. We heard that from Donald Trump during his uh, tumultuous visit to the UK. China sees it the other way, that they would still like the UK to be very much part of Europe because it's a chief financial center of Europe. Peter talked about the RMB trading hub. If the UK doesn't have its financial passport, as it's called, rights reserved about trading for free and, uh, and without borders across the US when it comes, uh, UK, EU when it comes to, for example, uh, the financial services, that would make London a much mm -hmm. less uh, attractive destination for Beijing trading and capital as well. So I think everyone is in a wait and see game here. Um, okay, there are strategic differences, but we really don't know yet what the UK is going to look like in a couple of years. Remember, they are negotiating Brexit in two years. Do you remember the Hong Kong handover back to China? Do you know how long that took to negotiate? 20 years. So it's really interesting time here. Philip, I just want to get back to a point, and you've written about this. You have said that uh... You know, Europe siding with uh, Beijing, with China, against Washington is a non-starter. Explain that to us, please. Well, I mean, as you know, there's something called the Transatlantic Alliance. I mean, the United States is a, is a leading member of NATO, so is the UK. Uh, when you talk about uh, preserving the international 
the rules-based rules international order, you're talking about freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. So sending an aircraft carrier, it, it, there's nothing really wrong about this. This is, this is something that the UK or any sovereign nation uh, can do if they, if they want to, to you know, use the, uh, the freedom of navigation. Um, so I think you know, there are a number of common grounds between the UK and the US and, and indeed with the EU. And don't forget that on, on defense issues and security issues, uh, the UK is, very, is still very much part of the Transatlantic Alliance, as well as uh, in close cooperation with uh, uh, its European neighbors. What do you make of that, Martin? Uh, should we look separately at national security issues, international security issues, and trade issues? Uh, yes, I think so. I mean, I, I, I think... Uh, Philippe is ro uh, looking through it slightly through rose-tinted spectacles, really. Uh, I mean, we're living through a period where there's been, there's, where there's very big shifts taking place of, of various kinds, uh, uh, most notably in the United States, uh, to some extent in China. Uh, we're not sure, uh, not so much with the, with the EU. And I think that uh, the relationship between the EU and the US is much less uh, clear uh, than uh, he is suggesting. I don't think, by the way, that, they, that, 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 what, that what was uh, done last week with Juncker uh, uh, when he went to Washington can be called an agreement. I think that this is, this is just an opening conversation uh, rather than something which is, which is finalized. Another point is that while it's true uh, that Europe, cer EU certainly still identifies broadly with, uh, uh, with with the West, as it were, including the United States, uh, it's got much less interest in what happens in the South China Sea than the United States. This is really an American issue, because it's about America seeking to maintain its primacy uh, in this part of the world. And I think, you know, this argument about freedom of navigation is, is just an excuse for the Americans to sail their ships in the South, sail, sail, their, sail their naval vessels in the South China Sea. The real interest of freedom na of navigation, above all, in the South China Sea is that of China, because China's, uh, for China, this is where 80% of its mm. trade is, uh, seabound trade is conducted. So I think that there's, there's, it's very difficult, actually, to freeze the situation in any sense at the moment, because we are living through a period of fundamental disruption. Uh, the, 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 the disruption, first of all, is caused by the rise of China. That is the underlying trend which has caused this situation. Trump is essentially, in my view, a response to this. Uh, it's a finally a belated recognition by the United States that China is uh, a challenge uh, to its position of primacy. Uh, and as a result of this, all the pieces on the board, the global board, in some way or other, are moving around and shifting around. And it's very difficult still to see, you know, where they're all going to fall. And, and, and Britain in this situation is a relatively small player, of course, but sometimes small players can play a big role. And a little example of this was in 2014, when the British government, really led by Cameron and especially Osborne, decided to take, make first mover advantage and join the AIB. Mm. Could Britain do something like that again? It's got to think in very different terms to the ways it's thought in the past. Whether it's capable of that, of course, is another matter. OK, lots more to discuss, but we are going to take a break right now. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat.